Good morning, everyone, and welcome to episode 26 of Builders Talk. Sorry I'm a bit late, had some problems with the internet, and hopefully that is all sorted out now, the joys of live technology. So this morning is episode 26, and I guess I can't believe that I've been doing this show for half a year now, and I can't even believe that it's nearly August and I can't believe that my daughter turns 18 on Thursday. So lots of things to celebrate at the moment and lots of things not to celebrate at the moment. But the Olympics is on, Australia's going well and probably has picked up some spirits that probably people need to I be picked up from at the moment. And I guess this week... I wanted to do something a bit different. I can see you there, Larissa. Thanks for joining us again. I usually script my show quite a bit because I want to make sure that I guess people who are listening to the show get provided with clear information and they don't get, I guess, off track like I do sometimes if I don't have prompts in front of me as to what I'd like to speak about. So the purpose of the show was to be able to deliver content that is informative and educational, and I I guess I wanted to have this as a no-fluff, I guess, um, and not to be padded out with off-track conversation or things that aren't really relevant to the show. But I've been thinking a lot about lately is the current climate that we are working in and wanted to have, I guess, a candid conversation about this. And I also wanted to have an unfiltered discussion about what is happening in the building environment, along with what brought me into the environment in the first place. So on the weekend, it was my dad's 80th birthday, and I did put a post up on Facebook about the influence that my dad had on me in wanting to work in the building industry. This was the springboard for me moving towards the industry and I guess me wanting to make a difference in the industry. So when I was at school, I used to work in the office with my dad. He was the director of a large interior fit-out company that did fit out some refurbishments of large sites such as the new Parliament House in Canberra, the refurbishment of the Queen Victoria Building in Sydney. I remember as a child, you know, walking around inside the Queen Victoria Building Uh, you know, and how magnificent and how intricate and how detailed this building work was. And I guess the diversity also of the work that he used to do there, you know, it would go from one extreme of the Parliament House in Canberra and the Queen Victoria building to spatial age refurbishments such as the Macquarie Bank. And I can still remember, I guess, walking out of the lifts into what was like a real space age type lobby with this psychedelic silver plated walls that were reflecting different colours and also reflecting images of yourself as well. And I can still vaguely, not vaguely, I can still vividly remember these, I guess, things about when I walked onto building sites with my dad. I still remember, and I think it was back in 1998 to 1990s when they were doing the first Roots Carlton in Macquarie Street in Sydney and I remember him taking me into the lobby and he, he pointed, pointed up to the wall and he said, see that tiny little hole up there? And I was like, yeah, there's a little hole, you know, thinking is he, is he trying to, what's he pointing out the hole for? Have they done something wrong or they need to fix it or how am I going to fix it? Because he'd often ask me, you know, how would you do this or what would that be or, you know, make sure you walk onto the building site like you own the building site. Don't get intimidated by, you know, the guys that are on the site and, so he, then he took me behind the scenes. So by now the the actual um, site was open to business and he took me into the back office and he showed me the, the office with all the cameras there and he said, see where we're standing? And there was an image of where we were standing in that in that lobby that was coming through this tiny little pinhole. And I guess, you know, all these things really amazed me and, and made opened up my eyes to all the things that were possible that you could do and do for people by building homes or or hotels. And, you know, this hotel to me at the time was pure luxury. And I remember saying to Dad when I saw their first female apprentice 
working in the factory that was a lady. And I said to him, that's what I want to do. And he said, look, it's not really a place for you to be. So that was back in the 1990s. I decided at that time that I still wanted to be in the industry. So I started looking at architecture, interior design and architectural photography. And even architecture, Dad said to me, unless, you know, you're really good, you'll just end up drafting for someone in a big office and not, you know, making that much money. I knew I wouldn't get the results I needed to go to uni for architecture. So I sort of put that out of my mind as an option. And I did work experience with an interior designer that my dad often worked with and also an architectural photographer. And I liked both of these, but once I finished school, I didn't really want to study any further at that time. So I signed up to a temping agency that, you know, got your work within in the city of CBD in Sydney. And I, I guess I fell into a position at Citibank in the city and that work wasn't really fulfilling to me. I was there for five years and I ended up deciding to go to university to do a marine science degree. So I actually am a marine scientist. And I guess that brought me around to deciding where I wanted to live, which ended up in Harvey Bay because the whales were here. But I guess all the while I was thinking about the, in, the building industry, but I just didn't really see how I could get into that industry. Um, at You know, back in the 1990s, it was fairly ma male dominated and I didn't really see a way of how I could, could get in there without obviously having really, really high um, scores in, on your HSC, so your year 12 certificate. Um, so it wasn't really till I met my husband, who was an engineer, that I started, I guess, dabbling in designing homes myself. And I taught myself to basically design homes. So just by exploring through various um, educational versions of Archicad, CAD drawings, SketchUp, because I was studying through TAFE to get my design licence, so the first house I designed, a developer loved it and commissioned us to build a display home for them in a new estate. And this went on to be the first home that we won a building award for. And I had worked for various other sort of project builders within our area doing their colour selections and some of the back office work such as contract admin until we opened up our own business back in 2004. We were quite lucky at the time because a bigger project builder that we had been working with, so I was there doing their colour selections and the contract admin and my husband was doing the site supervision, they decided to up and leave when the GFC hit and basically we were left with some of the clients that, you know, were halfway through working with that builder to get their project started and so they, they came over to us and we, I guess, got that first leg up into the industry. So... I'm just reading some comments from Larissa. What an inspirational story. No matter how long we're circling in our careers, we always are pulled towards our deepest passion, gifts and heart longing. Yes, you're correct. It's always sort of niggling in the back of your mind there. What if you could do something else or is there something else that that you, I guess, may have envisioned that you'd be doing but don't, see the, the path forward or how you can get there. But if you keep that vision in, in the back of your mind, it will circle around and it, it, you will be able to transform into that person that you may need to be for that position or, you know, get your way into it if you, if you don't give up on that dream. So I guess back to where I was. So we had that, that leg up into the, I guess, residential space. And there has been tough times that we've had to endure you know, we've nearly gone broke a few times. I racked up a $50,000 visa debit, oh, not visa debit card, visa bill. Um, I mean, just trying to keep our family household going. My husband didn't know about that card at the time and it wasn't until it hit the limit and it was, you know, that limit had all been used up that I had to fess up to him and say, I've run up this bill basically trying to keep us afloat. And I guess... You know, I often, I didn't want him to deal with the stress of the money. He was outside, on on site, working hard, working long hours, you know, trying to make it all work and bring money into our family. And I didn't have the heart to say to him, you know, this isn't working because you, you all, 
I guess you all think that it will work. You know, you just need that one more job or you just need this or you just need that or you just need a house that's a worth a big amount of money and everything will be okay. So you keep pushing through and, you know, you often might talk about do we give this up, do we go and work for someone, but the other option doesn't seem to be right for what you want to do or what you want to do with your family or the lifestyle you want to lead. So you might keep pushing through. And I often see in Facebook groups people mentioning that they don't seem to have much money in the bank or the husbands must be gambling it because they can't, they don't understand why they, you know, there's not money in the bank when they're working so hard and they're working so many hours, you know, or they might put a post that says, I've just found out my husband hasn't been paying our tax bill. You know, what has he been doing with the money? And it's, it's, I'm amazed by the comments from people that I guess we we just don't speak up and say what the truth is. Um, you know, some of their comments are like gambling. Oh, they must be gambling. Oh, are they going to the bar and hanging out at the pub all afternoon? Or, you know, are they buying you anything? Like the comments, are, there's sort of not really any one saying, hey, have you thought about the fact that maybe the business isn't going that well and, you know, the money that is hasn't paid to the tax office is actually being used to keep your your family's food on the table. You know, sometimes, and I've I've done it. You know, I haven't paid tax bills because I haven't been, had enough money to pay the tax, the pay, pay the like the commitments and pay employees. And you know, so it, we all go through this in our business, but it's not really spoken about, and it's not really brought to the front. And I've been through a lot. And I haven't probably spoken much about it because I usually try and guard myself and guard my life and guard my words because I don't want to hurt someone else or I don't want to have a difficult conversation because it might upset someone. So I've endured all these situations and it does hurt and it hurts even more that we when we don't share the conversations because these conversations could actually help someone else. If others knew the struggles that we go through, um, we could arm ourselves against these types of actions. And at the moment, you know, parts of the country are in lockdown. The building industry in Sydney has been shut down completely. COVID has wreaked havoc on all our lives and businesses in more way than one. And it is tough out there at the moment. And I'm going to say how it is and what I'm feeling. And as I said, I'm usually quite well guarded with my conversations. And I've thought, you know, I, I really have a... I really think about the words that I want to say to make sure that I don't affect someone or don't upset someone. And I usually, you know, have to be the bigger person or the humble person or the, you know, don't don't have those difficult conversations. But I think at the moment some of these words need to be heard and we need to speak up and we need, I guess, people to hear what we have to say. This may bore others. But what I'm going to talk about is the, our business model. So this, I guess the way we run our businesses has an effect on how profitable our business is and how profitable our industry is. And in the public eye, our industry is seen as one of, I wouldn't say greed. I guess it might be seen as greed. Um, not really sure what the right word is, but I guess it's, I guess the public perception of builders is we're making a lot of money. I'm going to say that again. We are making a lot of money. And I know that all the builders that are listening to this know that that is not true. So what isn't taken into consideration from a public percep perception is how much of that money actually ends up as the builders, the builder's bottom line or in the pocket of the builder. So, you know, we're contracted to build someone's house, commercial premises, a renovation, whatever we may be building. And I guess we've made a rod for our own back when it comes to the whole, you know, free quoting thing. The industry spends a lot of time doing work for free. And it's not just builders that are doing the work for free. It's all the trades. It's all the suppliers. 
you know, every trade that we have to get a quote from for the plumbing, the electrical, the septic design, that like all of that industry basically is, spends a lot of their time doing quoting for projects that they may never actually work on. You know, so it's to, to some extent some of this free work might get mopped up in the overheads of the business but not the full extent of the time that we spend giving free advice, you know, free site visits, um, free, you know, design consultations, back and forth, the amount of times that we go back and forth with people and then only to be pretty much ghosted by a lot of clients. You know, you spend all this time and a lot of them don't have, I guess, the decency to at least come back to you and say thanks for your time but we're going to go ahead with someone else and you know I often see this the other side of it in Facebook groups or you know even in our own community group they're like is there any decent trades out there is there any decent builders out there no one's getting back to me you know it does go both ways and we all need to learn to be a little bit more understanding of everyone's situations and, you know, just realise that we're all just humans and everyone has feelings and everyone's just doing the best that they can. So, you know, pick up the phone and, and say to someone, sorry, I haven't got back to you. It's been really crazy. And maybe they don't want to listen to what your excuses are because everyone thinks about themselves. But keep those communication lines open on both sides, on the builder side and on the client side. And... You know, the, I guess in the commercial side of things, as far as those overheads I was talking about, some of those um, overheads and, and free quoting and, you know, they're constantly tendering on things. That does get mopped up in some of those bigger businesses with their overheads because they obviously calculate, you know, they need X amount of employees and this is how much they need to, to cover those employees. But a lot of the... A lot of the building industry and especially the residential industry is made up of mum and dad businesses and, you know, they typically don't put themselves in their business as an overhead for themselves. You know, they, they, they might put their staff in it as an overhead but they don't often think about themselves as the money that they deserve to take out of that business. And I guess the Sydney shutdown has highlighted how vulnerable our industry really is and how little tolerance we have for any interruptions to our trade. I've seen so many panicked posts from owners of building businesses asking how they're going to get through this. You know, how are they going to get through this two weeks? You know, this is their only source of income. And I feel like, you know, they feel like they've been cut off at the knees. There was an article, I think it was in the ABC News, asking for the industry to be open back up in Sydney after the two weeks or otherwise it would collapse. And the amount of negative comments on that post and how about how unthoughtful it is for us that, you know, we've only been shut down for two weeks and there's all these other industries that since COVID have, hit, have been hit massively, you know, the tourism industry, the, the um, cafes and the arts industry. Like there's so many industries that have had such more a negative effect so far than what the building industry has as far as being shut down and, we need to see what, what needs to change, what has to change, what do we need to do to ensure that our businesses are not so vulnerable. You know, if we can't even shut down our, our business for two weeks, really something has to be changed. So we need to, you know, work out what do we need to do to ensure that our businesses are not so vulnerable. I guess I, I want to make this my mission and this is what I've been intending to do is to start the conversation to get the change happening. What can we do to make these changes happen? What do we need to put into place? And, you know, what, what can we do to stop, I guess, being pushed around and having, not to say pushed around, but I guess having this image of a dodgy builder. You know, the, the, the ones that go under maybe all give us a bad name because everyone thinks, oh, you know, they're just spending all the money on buying Lamborghinis and fancy cars and fancy boats. And, yes, some people do that to some extent, but they also do that in other industries. But, you know, is there someone drilling down and saying, okay, 
what were the precourses that led that builder into their demise? What made that builder collapse? Was it because they were buying Lamborghinis or was it due to the fact that they're playing the lowball game that we all get sucked into by trying to, to, to win jobs and, and just keep our doors open? You know, how does the industry benefit from that? The clients probably benefit because we're not probably charging the cost that it really is for what we're building. You know, I, I'm the chairperson of our local Master Builders Association and yesterday we had a meeting and there was an economic update that showed, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there's a graph. <laughs> Um, and you can see that that goes quite quite a big jump up, up, up this way. So these figures over here, I'm working backwards, um, this is sort of from the building industry chugging along in, so it's amount of building approvals basically. So the flat part of the line is since July 2019 and then the top part all the way up here, oh, I can't see it. If anyone's on just listening, you, I'm holding up a graph that's showing the industry at the moment. So the top part up here has basically gone from roughly, you know, for the last year, since July nine, 2019 to July 2020, there's been between on average 700 finance approvals and it's jumped up to 1,800 and that's, there's a lot of work happening out there, but we're also got a lot of heartache and a lot of businesses that are potentially going to go by the wayside. But what, what part have we played in our business model that has caused this to happen? You know, I'm going to make it my mission to go and, look at, I guess, how we can improve the industry. And, and this is, it won't, it definitely won't happen overnight. You know, it may, it may never happen in my lifetime of working in the building industry, but will it happen in my kid's lifetime? Yes, maybe, but not if people aren't pushing and looking at what is happening in the industry and what needs to change. The government you know, puts red tape around us to try and stop these things from happening. But it's not necessarily looking at the, you know, it's it's putting into place things like, you know, making sure you pay your tradies on time. But if we're not making the money that we need to make to be able to be paying these people, it's very hard for us to be able to do that. But the only ones that control that is is us and what we charge in the industry. And we need to look at you know, what are the true costs of building a house? We need to stop cutting each other off and I guess we've got to stop the price wars. And and I know it is hard because everyone just needs the work. And that's I guess probably where the mind the mind shift and the mind set is that but if I if I reduce, I mean, if I put my prices up, I'm not going to get any more work. Or if I charge for quotes, I'm not going to get any more work. So it is understandable, but we need to look at the costs of what it is and what we're building. And at the moment, the costs are going up quicker than our profits are actually um, sustaining. So there will be, unfortunately, people that will go on the wayside and hopefully there won't be too many suicides in the industry from what is happening. And we just need to be a little bit mindful and work as an industry together. Like typically builders, you know, we don't want to talk to each other. Oh, he's our competition. Oh, we don't want to talk to them. Oh, what passing Bunnings, but won't wave or acknowledge them. But we need to be talking together and we need to be trying to put better plans in place to put the industry in a better position so that if we do get locked down for two weeks, the whole place doesn't collapse. And I understand the industry employs a lot of people, 
But if we can't, we can't employ those people if we're not charging the prices that we need to pro, that we need to to keep our businesses afloat, to keep all those people in a business. You know, if the top of the chain goes, if the builders go, there's a lot of people that do come down underneath us, and I understand that's why we're saying, can you open us back up? But our business should be able to sustain some sort of shutdown or some sort of catastrophe. Of, of some sort you know we should have some of that money within our business to be able to keep ourselves going for you know what if we don't get what if you just don't get work for a month you know if we can't sustain ourselves without work for a month it you know things have got to change we need to start making the industry more professional and turning things around so that everyone within it can benefit and from the risk that we take, there's a lot of risk that's involved in a building business. And I guess a lot of people don't understand those risks or don't see that those risks that we do take as being those head contractors for the business. You know, everyone else underneath us, even if they do the wrong thing, you know, even if a tradie does the wrong thing and they're, they've not professionally done their work that they're licensed to do, you know, it's very hard for us to try and get that work fixed we end up having to pay for it because we're the one that's taken on the full responsibility, but everyone else underneath us can just wipe their hands from it of it. And that that's those sort of things are the things that need to be changed so that we can all, as a whole industry, be in a better position to be able to deal with these situations that may be thrown at us. So I'll leave it there for today and just, I guess, have a think about what you can do in your own business to make it not so vulnerable to the outside effects of, you know, everyone wants to, to, to blame the government, blame COVID, blame anyone else but ourselves, and we have to look at ourselves and say, what, what can I do or what can we do to make sure that you don't lose your house, you know, you don't use your livelihood, you know, put, put a more protection buffer around around yourself and allow for the ebbs and flows that happen in our businesses and, and be able to be comfortably sitting in that rather than all going into panic and collapsing because we haven't, I guess, thought about these things until something this drastic has happened within the industry. And, yeah, COVID has thrown a curveball for everyone, not out in our industry but every industry and we need to stick together and come up with a plan to make sure that we can all get through this without too many casualties. So until next week, I'll speak to you then.